Bismillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to this week's virtual salon. Thank you so much for those of you who are returning to the salon. It's wonderful to have you with us. And if this is your first time joining us, then please be so, so welcome. The virtual salon is a safe space for Muslims, Muslim intellectuals, academics, activists, creatives to come together to discuss some of the most important issues affecting our communities today. And today's topic is an extremely important topic, a topic that has come to light recently, but has been bubbling away under the surface for hundreds of years. And that topic, if not thousands actually, that topic is sexual abuse. So I'm your host, Naima B. Robert, and today I'm joined by an amazing panel of guests and I will allow them to introduce themselves when they start you know, having the discussion, inshallah. But my first question for any one of the panelists is, let's, let's start with getting our terms right, okay? What is sexual abuse? What counts as sexual abuse? What doesn't count as sexual abuse? What are we actually talking about here today? Would anybody of you like to answer that question in a really concise way? Don't all be shy now. This is the virtual salon. We don't Sorry, play like that, okay? Go. So, sexual abuse refers to any sexual acts against someone that they haven't given consent to. And you've got, um, I've did some notes actually because it's really good to have your notes and um, give all your parts so you've got two types of sexual abuse so you've got sexual abuse where um, someone has actually been either touched physically um, either through penetration um, or you've got other sexual abuse where a child may or a person may have been asked to strip um, for a camera so they haven't actually been touched so that's simplifying it really because in the short time we've got we're not going to be able to do it you know, the justice that we need to, and hopefully this will be the start of many um, <clears throat> webinars to come, but that's simplifying it, that's what it is. So um, we're basically I talking about... Else would like to, I don't know if anyone else would like to, you know, input on that. So basically so what we're talking about today is any kind of sexual activity that is non-consensual. Are we, are we agreed on that, guys? Okay, cool. So... Let's let's take this right to the nitty gritty, okay? I think most of you know, um, kind I of. Like, from, yes, yes, yes. So go ahead, please. I like to add to it. Yeah, yeah, add to it. I'm only, and um, I'm speaking specifically of childhood sexual abuse, and it's when any adult or um, older teen, where they force or coerce or bargain or trip or manipulate a child into um, sexual any form of sexual activity where they're going to receive gratification, um, sexual gratification. So we have sexual abuse where there includes touching and penetration. And then there's also forms that, um, that there's no physical contact whatsoever. As the sister was mentioning earlier, voyeurism, um, pornography, making a child watch pornography, um, making a child watch you um, masturbate, you know, um, perform, you know, of course, we know direct contact, sexual intercourse, you know, sex trafficking is definitely a form of sexual abuse. You know, any type of, any type of sexual contact, obscene phone calls, you know, as they call it, the phone sex, fondling, masturbation. So it's a very broad, broad range because, and that's so important for us to know because a lot of times um, children don't, may not even realize that they were, you know, adults, and children don't realize that they've been sexually abused because there's no physical contact. So, oh, he didn't penetrate, so I wasn't sexually abused. Oh, he only made me watch a video, so I wasn't sexually abused. Oh, he was only 15 and I was 12, so that's not sexual abuse. Okay. So, you know, um, I wanted to just, you know, add that part to the conversation. Yeah. Do you think as well, sis, that that's because the way that it's portrayed as well um, by society, that unless someone's penetrated, we have this, this uh, mindset that it's not actually abuse. So obviously, if that's what's ingrained in people, ingrained in families, generation upon generation, then like you said, someone may not even realize that actually they have been abused. Absolutely. And because of our unfortunate um, um, discomfort and 
speaking about this topic and because of the hush hush in our culture, especially in the Muslim community, we don't talk about sex. We don't talk about the body. We don't talk about what sexual abuse is. We don't want to talk about it. Many of us don't. And with prevention, we can, um, education can provide, prevention is possible through education, but we have to know exactly what it is. And uh, there's a lot of organizations out here, including my very own organization, Buddy Speaks, where we provide the education so that people can know and people can understand. And, you know, alhamdulillah, Sister Naima, for, you know, bringing this to the masses. Mashallah. Um, I just want to jump in there because uh, you mentioned the, the Muslim culture. And obviously this, the virtual salon is for Muslims to talk about Muslim issues, okay? And, and from a holistic perspective. So if you, maybe any of the panelists would like to speak either from their expertise or their experience, what are some of the, what are some of the issues that we as Muslim communities face in particular when it comes to addressing this issue of sexual abuse. Sister Sharia mentioned how Muslims don't like to talk about sex, and this is true, okay? There is a shame there. Somebody in the, in the, in the comments just mentioned shame, and obviously that's a huge part of it. But if, you, if, if my panelists would like to kind of go into that, because you're from a variety of backgrounds, uh, obviously expertise, etc. So what is happening in the Muslim community that is making it even harder for us to tackle this issue? Go ahead. Um, I think definitely that we have um, this culture where we shouldn't say anything. So you can't expose that person. You can't say what that person's done. And this has been drummed into us so much that we almost start to believe the rhetoric. And um, in, my, in my line of work, what I've come across, I've come across people where their main priority is to protect the perpetrator and not the person who's been abused. So for instance, they'll say, well, let's think about the bigger picture. So for them, yes. the bigger picture is yes. you can't bring the masjid down. Yes. You can't talk about the imam like that. So we'll sacrifice that child. We'll hang that child out to dry. We'll keep that child quiet in the name of, you know, almost protecting. Well, that's what it is. It's protecting and colluding with the perpetrators. So this is something that we come across a lot. Also um, in the, Borough that I'm in, one of the big problems we come across is not just within the Muslim community, but also with our local authorities. Again, it's such a, um, subhanAllah, it's such a minefield. But again, we have that problem where they see um, a black victim or an Asian victim as less than a white victim. Wait, break that down. Hold on a minute. That's a big thing to say. Okay, okay, so I'll explain. Bring your Delils this. What's the proof of this? <laughs> <laughs> big so thing to say. I'll, ex I'll explain what I mean. So if you have a look at when newspapers report about right. sexual exploitation, for instance, it will be Asian gangs grooming white girls. Right. Okay? That sells papers. It's, an, you know, it's, it's sensational, isn't it? It doesn't have the same ring as Asian man grooms black girl or black man grooms black girl. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the same, you know, impact. It doesn't sell papers, but this is not a true model. There is a model that happens like that, but this is not a true reflection. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, there is somebody that has joined and hopefully they'll be able to elaborate more on this in the after discussion, mm -hmm. who actually was involved in a lot of work in Rotherham, etc. But one of the things that was never mentioned was the fact that there was also black and Asian girls that were part of those rings that were oh, being groomed. Wow. wow. Yeah. That was never, ever mentioned. And when you mentioned that to me, I remember when we spoke before this session, actually, I was shocked because it was very much told the story structure was predator Asians, Asian predators, you know, grooming white girls specifically. And, you know, the whole story of, you know, they wouldn't do that to their own, et cetera. So it becoming very much a racialized thing, actually. So subhanAllah, the fact that that wasn't the full picture, that's something that I don't think most people know. But like, what's going on? What, what is it? Is it a media thing? Is it um, ideas about our cultures? Or is it that black girls are considered sexual anyway or sexualized anyway? What is actually going yeah, on? Yeah, definitely. I think that um, it is looked at that black black women or black girls are more sensual and, um, you know, an easy game. You know, I've had young Asian girls tell me that when they've spoken to social services and may have talked about, you know, a family member abusing them, it's been, well, 
you know, I don't know why you're making a big fuss of it. You will end up marrying your cousins anyway. Ooh, so if you've got so social cool. workers and if you've got people like social workers and local authority and police who speak to victims like this, then, you know, what kind of chance do they actually have? Wow. But definitely the rhetoric is if you're black, you're more likely to be a perpetrator than you are a victim. So, I, and that I can only speak about my experience and yeah. in the work that I've done, you know, with my young people. Um, I want to just jump over to Sophia for a second, inshallah, because I think this issue of, you know, the bigger picture and, you know, really, like you said, almost just, just, just shh, don't make a big deal because the, the after effects will be much worse. And then link of his family and the masjid and his reputation. Is this a problem in the Somali community, Safiya? Specifically, since, you know, I know that you work with many different communities, but maybe speak to us from, about your community in particular. So, salam alaikum to, uh, to everyone and jazakallah khair uh, Naima for, for doing this session. I work for a women's organization based in East London, um, specifically in Tower Hamlets. Um, and I guess um, each community has its dynamics and, 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 and barriers and challenges. And actually, what upsets me more is actually when certain communities believe uh, or have this concept that they are far from it, that it's not mm -hmm. them, it's other people. Mm -hmm. And I think unless you change that mindset, um, you know, uh, you, ca you can't prevent it, you can't be alerted to it, you can't support someone, um, because if you really believe that we're immune to it. Um, and actually, just like um, Jamila just um, uh, Camilla, sorry, just highlighted. It's really important to to note that that actually um, for 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 the victim, it's it's extremely hard, and it's dynamics, and mostly it's about the family. It's internal. You often don't hear about external. Um, you know, it's not. Um, interesting when I had a, a chat with with um, Camilla this week it wasn't often it's not external per a perpetrator it's actually internal um, and that's because I think it's, you know it's 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 the fact of if we're in the same household you know you're the uncle you're the auntie we're all okay and it really isn't um, the biggest thing that we've seen I guess in the last few weeks is, is the huge um, awareness of of victims um, speaking out about their their challenge and now it's obviously a trauma they've gone through and they're repeating a trauma and I'm really um, I deliver a number of different mental health courses and specifically, specifically looking at the trauma element it's not good to talk about the trauma generally um, however I think it's sparked a discussion that that here we are I guess uh, as a community as a part of the community we're having that discussion and when you listen to the people that have come to us in terms of our organization and you hear their story it's very much about I went to my auntie or I went to my mother or I told someone about my experience and that rejection of not being believed or was more traumatic for the individual mm -hmm. because then it means that you're carrying this trauma uh, and instead of having someone talking to you or actually overcoming uh, the, the trauma or the challenge um, or the abuse that you've experienced it means that now you're carrying it and then you're sort of that that is probably more painful for most of the people that we support that have come yeah. up and even when you yeah. listen to people's real stories and i think as a nation we need to really make it clear and i think the real discussion um, mm -hmm. if i'm being honest it's about parents yes. knowing how to protect their children it's about parents actually yeah. being alerted mm -hmm. to what is child abuse like you know it's not just the physical um and i've heard people saying oh he hasn't done it you know fully so um it's surely it's nothing to them you know don't dwell over it don't talk about it and for me, the highest uh, issue is that almost there is a blame factor, whether we mm. like it or not, on mm. the victim, i.e., what did you do? Or, yes. oh my God, for the rest of your life, you'll be known as the person that was raped. Um, mm. Do you really want people to know that? Do you know your future husband to know that you were raped and you're not a virgin or whatever that might be? So I think we need to have those discussions. But let me tell you one thing in the UK back home in Africa, wherever it might be around the world, it happens. So please, let's start saying, oh, this doesn't happen to us. It's far from yeah. me. And, and know that it actually happens in every community. I just need to jump and here I quickly to, I just would like to quickly jump and bring in Sister Rosaline here because uh, Rosaline, you deal with your uh, rapid transformation therapist. You deal with trauma, especially childhood trauma. So just for, because I mean, this virtual salon, you know, it's kind of, it's for grown people, really. Many of us mm -hmm. have children, many of us have older children. And so really the focus of this, this session is really for parents to become aware, for parents to know what sexual abuse is, the effects of it, and what we can do to prevent it, which we're definitely going to be talking about. But can you just enlighten us as to what are the effects of A, the abuse, and B, 
when you do tell someone and they don't do anything or they belittle it or they ignore it or they tell you to hide it, what, what psychological effect are we seeing with people who that's happened to? Assalamu alaikum everyone. Jazakallah khair and Naima for those really good questions. Number one thing that I see in my practice when I'm working with women who have been sexually abused is that they believe that it never happens. So because no one has believed them, maybe they've told someone that it's happened. Mm-hmm. And when they start talking about it, they go, oh, that couldn't have happened to you. What do you mean? I was always around, especially when they tell their parents. Mm-hmm. They start creating the belief that it never happened. Mm-hmm. So then what that happens in the end is that they, they don't trust themselves. So especially women who have been sexually abused phys- um, physically, mm-hmm. um, the number one thing they will say is that I'm a liar and I'm a bad person. Wow. And when you have that belief, it, and if you have the belief that I'm a liar and a bad person, it's all rooted in shame. And you find it very difficult to, you know, set healthy boundaries. You find it difficult to not people please. You find it very difficult to be yourself. And a lot of the women that I work with have depression, have anxiety, are suicidal because they know it happened to them, but no one believes them. Mm-hmm. That's, an, that's the common theme that I see, um, especially with what I do. So when I get to the root cause of it, it's like, when they get that release like wow it actually happened Mm -hmm. and they're able to release the feeling from that trauma the traumatic event that's when they build that build their confidence that's when they feel confident enough to tell people listen this happened to me and that's when they get inspired to change and to to change their behavior Mm -hmm. change the way they're dealing with that with the depression change the way they're dealing with their anxiety but that's the common thing is that I'm a bad person it never happened to me I'm a liar right so they're obviously echoing back something that they were told Maybe yeah, and, uh, yeah and it happened with me like my experience was I was sexually abused and I was exposed to pornography and you know the, the person was having intercourse with women in front of me so there was, there was two parts to it so for me it was like that never happened because when I told someone about it like my mom it was like she couldn't believe that happened so she was like no it never happened so it creates that belief that I must be a liar <laughs> And if I could just add to the conversation um, with what you're saying about parents, you know, it's an unfortunate shame. And that was one of the reasons why I started my foundation where, you know, I looked at the problem. I am also a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. And unfortunately, you know, I spoke out, but nothing happened. You know, mm-hmm. Nothing happened. It wasn't taken serious because it was an older, co- it was an older cousin. So, you know, later it was said, well, I thought you guys were just kissing cousins. So they didn't take it serious. However, you know, I grew up having to um, cope with the best way that I knew how, which was very, very unhealthy. And because I never received the, the help that I needed, the help that helped me to get through and know that it's, it's not my fault. I am not to blame. I am not to carry the shame. I didn't know how to establish healthy boundaries. And when I was raped again as an older teenager, as a teen on a date, I was, um, I, I kept quiet. I kept quiet. I didn't say anything. I blamed myself because, you know, the person tricked me into stopping at their house so they could go to the bathroom. And then Mm. what happened, they, you know, they they physically assaulted me and then they raped me. And then I said, well, how can I tell my mother this? I was only, I wasn't Muslim at the time. How can I tell my mother this? I was only supposed to go get something to eat and come straight Mm. home. So when I decided, I created my foundation called Bloody Speaks, where I provide education and awareness to help prevent and end childhood sexual abuse, I said, what I have to do is I have to help parents. We have to help educate the parents because a, a survivor, a child isn't responsible for protecting themselves from sexual abusers. We empower our children to speak out so that if someone you know, tries to groom them, someone tells them to keep a secret, someone um, um, shows them a form of affection and they don't want to, they let them know that they're the boss of their bodies, then um, the children can speak out. But the parents, we need to be the ones that's educated. Parents need to be educated on how to respond when their child discloses their abuse. Because as we know, once the child discloses their abuse, the healing begins. So depending on how you respond to your child when they disclose their abuse, um, they, they disclose their abuse could be a life of more shame and blame or a mm. life of healing. So that's what I said. And that's why I created a book. And my book is called My Voice is My Superpower. And it helps parents to have the conversation. And it's a child-friendly book and it has child-like illustrations, but it goes through the body safety rules. It helps okay. parents to know and understand how mm. to have the conversation because we do, we need to educate the parents 
because the Muslim community, we don't talk about it. It's, oh, we have to have witnesses yeah. or give them lashes for having sex. Oh, don't talk about this. Let the imam handle it. So okay. um, it's, it's very important. I, just wanna, that, I wanna add to that as well. Um, so, you know, when you are, and another thing is when you are constantly, um, when you constantly, the thing with the um, victims of sexual abuse is that they're guilty until proven innocent. Yeah. That's the issue. Oh, yeah. Everyone is guilty until you prove your innocence. So you yeah. constantly feel like you have to defend yourself. That's the issue. And another thing that I see with the, with the girls, with the, with the young girls, especially is hypersexuality. That's another psychological effect of sexual abuse is that your connection with the world becomes sexual. So this is why a lot of girls, we're going through like, you know, t the epidemic of teenage pregnancy. We're going through the epidemic of, you know, um, girls self-harming, self you know, girls not wanting to have that Muslim identity, maybe take that hijab off. I'm not saying that's the only cause, but that's one of the reasons why when you dig a bit deeper is because they were exposed to, to some form of sex, sexual thing or sexual abuse, like maybe pornography, maybe they were, um, maybe, you know, touching um, non-consensual uh, sex, all these things happen. So what happens is that they become seen, they're seen as the bad ones because mm -hmm. of their behavior, but they're just acting out. Right. They're just rebelling against what's happened. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. They're speaking and they're trying to tell you something, yes. but we can okay. know and learn mm -hmm. and understand the language that we're seeing. We have to, you know, when I, with my organization, I, I teach parents the signs of abuse so that when your child is self-harming or your child is um, sudden drop in grades or, you know, extreme people pleaser, or your child is very promiscuous, or your child, um, you know, ch has concerns and issues with their own sexuality, or your child is very, very sexual, or your child is using drugs, mm -hmm. or your child is, becomes yeah. defiant, angry, you know, um, these are all signs that something is happening, something is going on, and mom, I'm trying to tell you, yeah. but I can't, I don't have the, the, the vocabulary to say it. So can we just agree? And if I could just add one yeah, more sure. thing. When we talk about, um, what the sister was saying previously that um, society says you're guilty until proven innocent. If we look at statistics, only 2% of um, victims lie about being sexually abused. So we're mm. talking about 90% of, um, of children or adult um, childhood survivors who speak of their abuse, 98 out of 100 are not lying. So um, we have to say that they are, the children are telling the truth mm. until they're proven that they're lying. Exactly, yeah, that's exactly. Me. That's, that's, that's I, the root, yeah. I, I def there's two things I want to pick up on, inshallah, definitely. Um, one is I want to come to Camilla about the victim blaming, uh, because I, we've had a conversation about that before, but I just want to bring Brother Musa in. Um, Brother Musa, what's been happening? Why did we start talking about this issue? Like what's going on with the youth out there? What's happening on social media? What's, 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 what's happening? Okay, yeah, so yeah, I'm, I'm, my name is Musa. Um, I'm, I'm the founder of Resource, an organization, it's a charity that um, supports homeless people in the UK and refugees and people like that. And also I'm someone who worked for the last 10 years um, with an organization called Roadside to Islam. Roadside to Islam was a pathway for reverse who had converted to Islam from the inner city, coming through, I would say, gang backgrounds and just living a certain type of lifestyle and then embracing Islam and trying to find their way. Through this, we were able to, you know, gain a lot of, I would say, a lot of understanding with the communities that we were coming from, young girls, young boys, born Muslims, those who had reverted to Islam. And something that came to light for me and Abu Bakr, who the founder of Roadside to Islam, was that so many young girls had been sexually abused and it was something that you know wasn't really known to myself growing up you know as a youngster within the UK and even just listening to you guys uh, there was a statement that I saw um, last week sometime on social media where it said that every female knows someone who's been sexually abused but not every male knows an abuser meaning that for you know for like for every you now if you was to ask you know like any lady out there you know have you been sexually abused or do you know someone everybody says yes but when it comes to the men to, if you ask them do you know any of your friends or anyone that you've been in contact with who is a predator or sexual abuser everyone's like no I don't know and that's including me so that's come to uh, something that comes to my mind in terms of what can men do more to look out for signs you know of it's difficult what are the signs of someone who you know 
has that tendency to be abusive, to be a predator, whatever it may be. What are those signs? Because as men, we we have too many friends. We only find out when that person has been exposed. We only find out when that person, you know, gets arrested. But between that and then, we we never know anything, and we you know we just don't see the signs. Or is it that we're a bit too uh, lackadaisical, or we just think, you know, he's just in brackets a uh, ladies man or yeah you know it's like yeah. what are the things yeah. that yeah, yeah what are the things that we're missing out as men in terms of you know being able to spot these signs being able to do much more within the community and within the muslim community with a lot of the stuff that's come out recently i feel like a lot of emphasis is also on family and young people including boys being molested being abused being raped within the family structure being and that's also including the community including you know the madrasa school outside activity sports whatever it may be within the community too many of our young people are uh, have been you know abused within this community structure the muslim community structure and there is that that you know keep quiet don't say anything that blame uh, mentality but then on another outlook i've come to I've come from some of the, you know, things that I've been reading and going through. A lot of the time, some of these parents who are quick to shush their children, also victims of the very Mm -hmm. same children are going through and they haven't healed, nor have they come to the process of understanding what is. Example, if we look at the female community, a lot of the time it's done by the aunties, it's done by the women, the aggression that takes place within our community. It's not, and I think, because they have gone through things that they deem to think are, you know, are okay or simple. Yeah. It's just a way of life. It's our culture, how we were brought up. And then they implement this onto the children and continues through into a, a cycle where they, you find young people, obviously with social media and being in a new generation where young people are just more vocal about and like, like uh, one of the panelists said, uh, we like to so we see statistics where you know that you know, one in every six women have been sexually abused, but we think for some reason the the Muslim women, or right. you know, as if yeah. for some reason the statistics don't apply to us, yeah. and we try to you know make ourselves us and them. And I feel a lot of the 100%. Um, I think I might have lost you there, but I, this is something that I really, firstly, uh, before we go into the Muslim attitude specifically, and also the victim blaming, I want to go over to Camilla. But one of the thing, one of the questions I have is, you know, in our communities, many of our communities, the, the issue of honor, okay, and family honor and family name, and your place in the community is so paramount, right? And this whole thing of having radar for your family members. So I'm going to ask Brother Musa as the only male on the panel today. How come is it that if you hear that someone has touched your child or hurt your child, like how come your instinct is not to go and kill that person? Like how come your instinct, or is it that the men are not told? What's happening? Because I would expect, you know, in this framework of Izza and Ghaira and all of this, I would expect a father to hear something like that, his first instinct would be, I'm going to kill him. But we're not really necessarily seeing that happening. So am I getting the wrong end of the stick? Is it that the men are not told? Is it women keeping the secrets? What's happening? I feel like, again, coming from uh, someone who embraces, I feel like coming from a river aspect and I'm not sure about the Muslim community, you know, it's still the aspect of if someone touches one of mine, then something has to happen. I don't know any brother right. that would be any, that would be different from that. But then like I'll say the last, you know, my last 10, 11, 12 years within the Muslim um, culture, I feel like already cultures that, you know, our community come from, women are sometimes, you know, put to the side and they're like a second class citizen in a lot of the things that happen within the community and family. And I feel like that also is shown where like when I speak, when I speak or I've been in, in Muslim communities and especially sometimes women are seen as a, a burden or when they get married, they then, you know, end up with the, with the husband's family. They're no longer our problem. How much money are we going to get for our daughter? How much is the mahra? All of these type of things, whereas as if it's like, 
you know, that we raise this woman or this child, and then when she gets to a certain age, she gets married, and then she goes off, and we never see again. It's like the women are just passed on to, to the male families. And this cultural understanding, I feel like the women are seeing one, but for a lot of what I've seen, and I feel like this is why sometimes when things are said, you know, women are treated a certain way. It's like example, us um, at Rosa to Islam, we're asked to talk many times. One of the topics we were asked to talk about um, uh, uh, forced marriages and things like that. But looking into cultures, because the Muslim, you know, community, we're not just one culture. There's many cultures within, you know, our community, and people, you know, tend to things uh, differently all the time. Uh, when you come to understand some of the pressures within the culture communities they build businesses and organizations that are dependent on the community supporting them so here you have a father who has a shop that's been going for 20 years and his shop and his livelihood and paying his bills and supporting his family back home is all based on this community supporting him and giving him everything someone from that community asked for his daughter's hand in marriage and he refuses and then he's dealt with threats of the community boycotting him you know his business going down drain and stuff like that i feel like there's so much social pressures that go into a situation sometimes it's easy for us to kind of look at it from you know from the outside in and think like what are the men doing or like what's the issue and it's easy for us to talk on it but i feel like there's just so many things to unpack within the muslim community in terms of why some pressures are how they are it's not excusable but it's something that you know i've had to look at before i just come out and speak i have to understand the mm. nuance and, mm. and the, the, in the politics of what's really going on here because like you said as a man you think hold on his, his first thought should be to protect his daughter, to protect his family. Like, why is he thinking like this? But a lot of the time, there's so much social pressure. And we see this within any walks of life with our young people. The, 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 the circumstances a lot. And sadly, I feel like the women suffer a lot when when it comes to this in terms of what we're seeing today, them not being believed or them being, you know, like them being overlooked and and just being treated as if they're not worthy of anything because some of the stories that you hear you think how can a mother or a father stand by and allow something like this to happen to their child knowingly that the child has come to them and said this and this yeah. has happened yeah. and they've yeah. shamed them into yeah. believing or to mm -hmm. staying quiet mm -hmm. i, I want to go to thank you so much for that musa i would like to go to camilla now because i know that you're familiar with this whole dynamic so what's the deal with the victim being blamed. She did something. She must have done something. She wasn't dressed appropriately. She was in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, she asked for it. She did something to, to, to allow this to be. What is, what, where is that coming from? Um, well, before I answer that, I've noticed that quite a few people have been putting in the comments speaking about um, boys being molested as well. So I think it yeah. is very important for us yeah. to touch on that just a little bit that yes, um, women do also abuse. It's a small, a, a small percentage, um, but yes, women do also abuse and men do also abuse boys. Um, so this is something that we do need to look at. I don't know, is the internet a bit funny? Can you hear me clearly? No, it's okay now I've muted everyone else. Okay, right. So, um, Basically, what we have to look at is that there are other models. Yeah. So, as I said, women do rape boys. They do abuse boys. Um, and you see the dynamics again shift, whereas it's like, oh, come on, like he was 13 and, you know, she was a, this hot teacher or whatever. And it's not viewed the same. It's not viewed right. the same as a man who would be a teacher molesting a 13 year old girl. And that's so it's part of a culture like, as well. It's like a cultural thing. It's almost yes, like, it's, oh, he it's was so almost cute. like a pat, that's why you know, she couldn't resist him. And yeah. Yeah. A pat on the back, you know, oh, wow, you managed to pull that female teacher. So right. it's also how that's society complex, looks at it. Again. So yeah, so again, we forget about that. And we also forget about um, that boys are actually abused as well. And this is something that when we talk about shaming and victim blaming, you have this, um, almost it's like a consensus that you can't say anything because if we talk about our son being abused, then everyone will think he's a homosexual. 
everyone will you mean to be abused by a man yeah by a man yeah then everyone will think he's a homosexual everyone will think he's this way inclined whereas this is like an irrational fear mm -hmm. you know it's an irrational fear and this irrational fear and this what people call honor it's like i was saying to i think to yourself the other day when you think of this word honor something that would make a man take his daughter chop her up torture her and kill her because she hasn't married somebody who he wants her to marry this is a barrier that is so hard to penetrate mm. and something that is so important for people to understand is until you can penetrate this barrier you can't even start to talk to people about abuse mm -hmm. You can't even get them to see that it's actually incorrect and that it is so, so horrific and wrong. You really, um, it's, it's, you know, there's a colleague of mine that, as I said, she's there and she can probably talk a lot more about it afterwards um, because she knows a lot more about it. But it's something definitely that I have seen within the community that I work in that definitely is honour and this victim blaming. Mm -hmm. So victim blaming and, you know, we're just as guilty of it as anyone else. You know, look what she was wearing. Um, why was she on her own in the room with him? Yeah. Um, you know, well, everyone knows that she likes going to certain places. Right. She must have asked for it. You know, I had a scenario where I spoke to somebody about a young girl was walking through a park on her way home, um, was brutally attacked and raped. And the first thing they said, well, well, why was she walking through the park on her own? But it happened to be, I said it was in the evening. It happened to be in the summer. It was about 7.30, so it was still light. And the park was adjacent to her house. But straight away, yeah. we wanted to ask, why was she in the park? Not, yeah. you know, talk about this perpetrator who had raped her, but place the blame at her door for going about her daily business, yeah. walking through the park and going home. Um, we had another incident where a mother walked in on her nephew, saw him pulling up his trousers. It was obvious he had done something to her daughter. She didn't say a word, not a word to the boy or the daughter. Um, the boy went out, she didn't ask the daughter anything. And the daughter noticed after about two, three weeks, she didn't see the cousin come to the house. And she went to the mother and she attempted to speak to the mother and the mother told her, I don't ever want you to speak to me because of you, I've lost my brother. So she was more concerned about the fact that she she'd warned her brother, this is what I've seen, he's taken the child away, and she was more concerned about not seeing her brother than what she'd walked in on. Subhanallah. So again, this girl was made to feel she was to blame. So it, there's so many instances of it, and we are guilty of it. You know, we are the first to say, well, you know, look at her, she was out there in a mini skirt, she was drunk, she was talking to this one. What did you expect? But then... What about a woman who goes out who's covered and she's raped? Yeah. And we know this happens. We of know that it does. Happens. We of know course that. it does. And the thing is, well, just to jump in there, you know, when, when, people, when people talk about, and I'm coming to you, Sophia, after inshallah, so I got you. Um, this whole thing about, you know, they, the, the girl being too sexy. That's why he did that. Because she was too sexy. Either she's too beautiful or she showed herself in a way or she behaved in a way. How then do we rationalize when it's infants you know when it's ah. toddlers you know when it's four five-year-old children this for me is something that I, I i can't really wrap my head around um so subhanallah this you know this we we yeah anyway we're gonna we're gonna go into that inshallah but yeah it's um yeah go ahead Sid. So, Jazakallah khair, uh, some amazing points, Wallahi, and I think, uh, you know, this, this session is, won't give it justice, but I think it's really important that we touch on everything just to kind of bring it to, to our forefront and maybe, inshallah, as a community, we can address it more and kind of explore it and maybe come back to it as well. I think one thing in terms of um, the, the, the interest in fathers and fathers not what why don't we hear the father did something to somebody because somebody did to his daughter again it goes back to the shame element and if i sw swiftly kind of uh, drain you know concentrate on the somali community specifically and even forget this country for a second you know back home you would hear some girl who is what 10 years old abused by a big grown man and the next thing you will hear is the family paid compensation to the tribe or the father or the family. And therefore now they will marry the daughter. To <gasps> the 
that's been done no. and, and, and maybe she's too young so we'll wait for her to get older until she does so I think it goes back to the fact where they're so overwhelmed by trying to hide the shame and the consequences that their child has faced uh, to the extent that, um, that, that, they, that they would put their child at the forefront to say hey you know you've done something together go and marry and I think it's really important also to highlight um, in certain situations where it's actually your mahram that does it so how do you deal with that? What do you do if it's your real uncle? What do you do if it's your, um, if it's your father as well? We've heard cases of, of situations like that. Uh, and, and I think it's really important to, to know that sometimes even in your household, what are they going to say that she didn't cover up in her household in front of her uncle? Of course she didn't because she doesn't have to do that. So these yeah. are sick people that need to be dealt with. And when I say dealt with, unless as a community we start punishing the perpetrators, Unless people start going into prison, unless as a community we start naming and shaming the perpetrators, we're sending a strong signal to the younger generation, to the next generation to highlight and say, actually, if you do X, Y and Z, you will be put in prison because this country has laws. And remember, the laws of this country is that if someone does commit a crime, and this is a crime we're talking about, and you, uh, you brush it under the carpet, you are also a part of it. You know, there is consequences for you as well. You are a part of that, 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 that sexual, uh, uh, what, what they call it, the ring f- um, circle or whatever they might call it, that, that network of abusers, the one who abuses, the one who goes silent. And Islamically, we know that if you can't stop it with your hands, you know, there, there are things for you to do. But being silent and leaving it to happen is not something that comes from our deen, nor comes from our natural human instinct. And remember, if you don't speak up, for the victim and you don't ensure that they get the justice then what are you sending to the victim you're saying it's okay to abuse someone and then they become potential abusers as well because it happened to me and and nothing happened to the abuser and now i have all these feelings and 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 and, and sexuality that i need to, to to experience so i think as a community know this that if you don't deal with it now as parents as communities as muslims if we don't deal with it now we're saying it's okay and we've got your back as the abuser because it's easier to support the abuser than to support the victim. And that's something really important I want you guys to digest. It's easier to support the victim, the perpetrator because you, all you have to do is go silent. Exactly. And it's harder to support the victim because now you have to go through the whole process. You have to get them the, the, the specialist help and support that they need. You have to make sure that you tell them that you believe them and you support them. So I think as a community, we need to come out of our comfort yeah. zone. We need to have those discussions with our children. But when something happens, yeah. it is far upon you, far upon you to speak out speak out for the hub speak out for the victims and make sure that you protect them because you're protecting the next generation as well so i fear that you've just given a whole word there and i i, I just 100 percent co-signed that and i hope you know mashallah i hope everyone here understands this we have the ability to turn the tide in this generation we have the ability mashallah how many of you are parents in this room? Just give a yes, you know, in the comments. How many of us are parents? We're all parents here. Most of us have got children, no matter what age, which means that there is something we can do here. And I don't want anybody to feel like, you know, the community is this big entity that can't be changed. It can't be controlled. Culture can't be changed. Culture is dynamic. It's changing all the time. And the fact that we are here in this gathering, having this conversation, this is a change. And I don't want anybody to underestimate this because it's, it's a, literally a situation of each one teach one. The lovely, the amazing panelists we've got here, all with their different expertise and specialisms coming together to teach us so that we can then tweet about it, put it on Instagram, but more importantly, speak to our family members and our friends and enact these, these, these principles within our homes. So if this ever comes to any of us, we at least know A, what the signs are, which we're going to talk about, and B, what is the correct way to deal with this? What is the way for us to be able to start really making people feel consequences? Because I'm sorry, just, I just have to say for a second here, I really feel just bro- jumping off Brother Musa's point. Within the Muslim community, crimes against women in general are enabled. Whether it is abuse, sexual abuse, domestic violence, you know, whatever, divorces, all this kind of thing. We are surrounded by enablers because it's easier, as you said, to support the perpetrator, to keep things quiet, to keep the peace, to keep the status quo than it is to stand up for the haq and for justice. 
So with that in mind, who would like to speak on A, what parents should be looking out for? And B, the next question is, you know, I, I, there's, a, there's a point here because um, we were discuss I discussed this with several of you beforehand. And this issue of, you know, the victim, what the victim could have done, what she should have done. Um, Camilla, you mentioned something very important when we were talking about this because you were talking about how the focus is always on what the victim did, what the victim should have done. But what is the question actually that we should be asking? Is it about the victim or is somebody no, no. else who should we should be talking about? It's here? definitely about the perpetrator. And, you know, something I always say is that we need to understand the blame lies 100 percent with the perpetrator. The perpetrator is the one that has committed the crime and they have committed the act against that victim. The victim shares no part in the blame whatsoever and I know there will be people that because they're in some form of denial or the way they've been conditioned will still have that idea or that ideology well you know yes it was the way she was dressed no the perpetrator had no control is a predator and that's what they chose to do so the blame lies a hundred percent with them in regards to bringing people to justice this is something, um, again, that I'll say that justice looks like different things to different people. So you may have some victims, um, survivors that will say, well, do you know what? I told somebody and they actually believed me. After 10 years, someone actually believed me. And for me, that was enough. That was enough. I just wanted someone to believe me. You may have another person that says, well, I want everyone to know that that's what he is. I want everyone to know that he abuses children or he abuses women. And then you may have some that say, well, actually, I want it to go all the way to court and I want this person to be imprisoned. So we can't put it in one box. It's different things for different people. And we always have to bear in mind what that victim and survivor wants, because maybe when they're saying to you at that time, I just wanted someone to believe me. Five years down the line, they may come back and say, actually, now I've got the strength and I want that person prosecuted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So something that we need to be very careful of is that we don't push anyone to do something that they're going to feel uncomfortable with. Because when someone's pushed and they're already fragile and they're suffering from trauma, it can have devastating consequences. It can end up with that person taking their life, turning to drugs, turning to alcohol. So we have to understand that we've started this, but everyone has to bear in mind this is just the beginning of the journey. It's not going to change overnight. We have got a mountain to climb. Mm -hmm. At the moment, we're at that bottom of the mountain, but we've started the climb. And we've got a mountain to climb. And we've got to keep educating our people, our communities, and talking about this and getting them to understand the role they play in it. And a question you asked me the other day about, can we prevent it? The answer to that is actually, the person who can prevent it is the perpetrator. The person who is committing that crime. However, what we can do is we can have a look at what share of the blame we take. And is that blame that we're not vocal enough? Is it that we don't teach our children? Is it that we're complicit in covering it up? Of that, yes, the many in the community are guilty. But the actual person who commits the act, that lies 100% with them. I just want to just jump in with um, uh, uh, Sharia. I see you there, girl. I'm coming to you. Uh, <laughs> Brother Abdul Wahid Stevenson has joined us. Brother, are you on video? Just because uh, I salam really alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. I really wanted to, uh, to be able to bring you in just to educate all of us, I guess, on the Sharia perspective, because I think we've discussed the issue of, um, of honor and is that as it's culturally known, um, and also the idea that people feel like the big picture, Yani, the peace and keeping the peace and keeping ties of kinship is more important than kind of justice or healing for a victim of sexual abuse. So I, I, I think for all of us who are watching, is there an Islamic case for like lying about abuse or hiding it or kind of trying to shush it or anything like that? Is there an Islamic basis for that? Uh, Bismillah. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to echo what uh, Sister Camilla was speaking about. I think she made some very strong points and I really, um, you know, uh, 
when she said about you, there's, you shouldn't really push the victim because, you know, they know kind of how they want to uh, address it and move forward. That might be, for example, you know, mentioning that and someone knowing about it being enough for them so that they can stop it from continuing. It might be the case that later on down the line, they want, they're more vocal, they want to take it further. I think that's really an important point that she made. Generally speaking, obviously, it's a crime. Uh, and once the allegation's been made, then it has, it's, it, it has to be dealt with. It can't be hushed up. Uh, Islam doesn't say, hush it up, hide it, you know, don't, you know, keep silent, don't speak about it. It's a very serious uh, thing that's happened. And, you know, it has to be addressed uh, because it's a crime that's been committed. Uh, and obviously justice, it has to uh, be, justice has to basically prevail. And that justice is, you know, has many different uh, forms. It may be a, one of the ways that, that justice happens is obviously the person that's done the action, then they're, you know, taken to account for that. Whether it's legally in the, here, for example, you know, in the case where uh, it's taken to the police, or whether it's uh, something which they're prevented from doing that uh, and it's made known, for example, that you know, this allegation has been made, it's an allegation and it's, you know, it has to be proven, but there, there has to be a, basically a process, a due process. Uh, one thing I want to highlight, and it might not be popular because there seems to be, social media has made it very easy to throw, throw allegations and they're not being necessarily, uh, you know, it's not dealt with in a, it's become a kind of like a kangaroo court where a person's honor, like you, you were speaking about, is actually, uh, you know, tarnished and the allegations are not substantiated or they haven't been dealt with in the proper way. There hasn't been a due process. And one thing which Islam is clear about is that allegations, they, there needs to be a due process, basically. I think that's something which needs to be highlighted as well. Okay. So if somebody said to you, you know, as Muslims, we should cover the sins of our brother, we shouldn't expose the sins. If Allah hasn't exposed him, then you shouldn't expose him. What, what, what's, what's your take on that? Uh, what, the, the most, I think uh, that's incorrect when it comes to uh, raising a case against somebody. So, for example, there's no backbiting when it comes to raising a case, uh, you know, against a person or against an individual. The backbiting doesn't come into it. Covering sins don't come into it. That's not the issue. Which is at hand because because there's been an, an, an a crime, for example, right. has been committed. Okay. So that doesn't come that doesn't come into it at all. Okay. It never has uh, done. It right. never has done. Okay. Yeah. So so okay. Uh, I think well, I think one I think one thing which is clear, and I don't think it's uh, something which is uh, uh, only men that do do it. it it's mm -hmm. women and men, yes. or in relationships. Yeah. Let's say relationships, utilizing the dean to cover their to allow them to continue tra to transgress yeah. and to go beyond boundaries with regards to relationships or the rights of another person. And that's something that needs to be kind of, you know, stopped uh, at the off. It turns to a method of control and manipulation, which is not what the dean is there now. I have something else as well to add on this. Okay, so when we're talking about abuse by family members, just like Sister Safiya mentioned about abuse by the mahram, so obviously we know that the rules of hijab uh, are, you know, relaxed in front of a mahram, as Allah has said. Do you, what is your advice for parents? And I just want to make it clear to everybody here, in general, the virtual salon is a mixed space. Y'all need to come up here with your husbands and your spouses and your brothers and your sisters and your big kids, okay? It is that kind of space. It is not a sister's only discussion. It, this type of conversation can never be a sister's only discussion. This is a community issue, okay? So Brother Abdul Wahid, I have a question with regards to hijab and, and just trusting the mahram because if it's happening within the family, as mothers and fathers, what is, what should we be doing? Because obviously we're much more relaxed around the people who are the qara'ib, the people who are supposed to be close to us Islamically, you know, who are supposed to be relaxed and feel safe around. You know, what, what's your advice to us now? As we do know 
that is it the majority what's the percentage guys anyone just unmute and say tell me what the percentage is what sharia what's the percentage of of uh, abuse that happens as a result of from a from a close family member 90 percent of children that are um victims of child uh, of sexual abuse are abused by people they know and love and trust subhanallah familiar on this number one 90 yeah. percent it's the number one so yeah, what, what should islamically what are we saying yeah so my question is you know what what do we do with that knowing on the one hand that you know islamically these are the qara'ib these are people we should be able to trust with our children etc but then also knowing that 90 percent of perpetrators will be of those close you know of those close family members how do we now balance that within our families and that the dynamic within our families enjoyed this conversation and you would like to become part of the virtual salon family consider becoming a patron from just five pounds a month you can get access to our chat community to be invited to our live sessions and get exclusive content that we only create for our patrons be part of the movement sign up on patreon today <laughs>